anyway, uh, let's take a look at what's happening around here. Paulie doing a great job giving you guys critical areas for you to pay attention through throughout the uh, trading day. So let me take the screen. I have a couple of things that I'm considering here. Okay. So how are my trading warrior brothers and sisters? Everyone doing okay? Yeah, give me a why if you are. Let me know you're live out there. So um, I'm trying to be patient for lower levels to buy the gold. I'm thinking around 1280. But there is a bit of a correlation between gold and the Aussie. And I would not be short Aussie. Maybe Aussie's going to turn before the gold. But this is pretty classic uh, one, two, three. Sometimes, though, on the third drive, you can get a fractal where, you know, even though this is the third drive, you could have a three drive pattern within the third. So, uh, you know, I, I, if you need to do something, you just put a small piece on knowing that we could retest the lows and diverge again. The one hour, it's pretty glaring. Look at the divergence down here on this candle compared to there, and the four hours looking the same. Uh, very tight little three drive uh, wedge probably developing between 140 and 240, which tells you if we could start getting through 220, you know, there might be 100 pips to the upside on that. Okay. Uh, something else that, you know, I'm just uh, uh, looking at, I caught last week. Um, you know, there's an expression, stick with what got you to the dance. So last week uh, was going through a, a bit of a drawdown on some negative news out of uh, the UK on the short euro pound up here, you know. I was shortening it in the 50, 60 range right here. I don't see that, you know, and then they gave uh, the UK a um, one month extension and the pound exploded. First there was bad news and it went up to here to 91. Pretty good break, 160 pip break. So I see this as um, a shorting opportunity with stops over the high. You don't want to fight it if that happens and there's potential that we have at least this from here and uh, Greg is talking about the same thing on the week ahead video. I don't know if we have any pips, but you could have a quality longer term. I'm still bullish this pair, but uh, we could get a quick little uh, ABC, this being A and this being ABC for B and get a C to the downside. Uh, I'm really an amateur technician, okay? Hiya, Craig, how are you? Marius, Martin. And I'm trying to be patient with the gold. I know it's up a little bit today. Um, I'd really like to, there are a couple of reasons that I'd like to see another $10, $13 lower in gold. Maybe I won't get it. I'd really like to see them flush out uh, the longs here. That bought the first dip thinking, you know, we were on our way to 1240 or so. So uh, I'd like to see her bound 1180. And another reason is uh, there are some targets up about uh, from 1235 to 1260. Um, this from 1160 was $55. So, you know, I'm just doing a little addition and subtraction. If you could add, subtract, multiply, and divide, you can trade. So get your flashcards out. I think, you know, we get down to 1180 and we have a similar move. That's going to take you to 1235. If we get a fib extension of this, you know, that's how you could get 1260, 1270 on gold. Uh, perhaps uh, we need silver to, which is really the weakness, you know, no divergence. Um, to trade a little bit down, I saw targets as low as 1360, Peter Brandt, I think it was. But I'd like to see another uh, lower two in silver to set up the buy and gold around the 1180 level. I'm not sure if we have any patterns in play looking to do it or not. Um, everyone with me, you don't have to agree with my analysis. I'm just get, sharing my thoughts and the rationale for it. Okay, because this is intelligence gathering here. So I'm using what little intelligence I have to share with you guys every morning. Okay, 
I just want to touch on the indexes again. You know, people are probably so frustrated trying to topic this thing. I know I've done it about 10 million times, but you know, yesterday I was showing the return line, the throw over in um, the Dow, which it was respecting all day yesterday. As you could tell, you know, we tried it a couple times here. Uh, the Dow was living back within the wedge. So this, I'm sure who's still short after this? Hard to short. Could we rally again? Uh, this is a nice little pivot point here. Um, but what changed is before yesterday, the S&Ps were way above that, this line. You know, they came in like, you know, here. All right. So we held it on Friday, rallied, made a lower high, and now uh, S&Ps as well are living back in the wedge. So uh, be careful. All it's going to take is one bad day in Amazon for uh, some of you. You think about it, uh, most of the FANG leadership is shot. Uh, yeah, we're getting bear market rallies in Netflix and uh, Facebook is a broken stock. Uh, Apple is a king, you know, uh, but way stretched out, probably almost as stretched out as Amazon. And Google, uh, I saw a chart by Helene Miser. Uh, she's a great technician, and uh, she showed Google breaking down yesterday. So part of my intelligence gathering. So, you know, uh, this is how I use Forex Analytics. Um, so that I don't become completely dependent upon guys that, whose work I respect is you formulate your own plan, okay, what you're thinking of doing, and then you go to the uh, traffic light page, you know, and take a look at comparative views of the same instrument by Grega, right, by Andre, by Steve and Blake. And uh, you'll find sometimes, uh, Blake has talked about that, when there's confluence between different methods saying the same thing, they're usually pretty strong signals when everyone's in agreement. But um, that's how I do my intelligence gathering. I think it's important that you develop your own ideas, uh, but be open to the potential that maybe you're not seeing everything. And when you go to guys that you respect and you're looking at their work, uh, they may be able to save you some heartache. Uh, they may give you more conviction about what you're seeing yourself and uh, think is a great way to use it. And the only way you'll know if, uh, you know, it's a great tool for intelligence gathering is to sign up. So uh, take a shot. I'll make the same offer I did before my vacation. If you don't think you get $1 worth, I'm going to mail. Uh, a refund, uh, postage due. You'll you'll have to pay for the stamp. Okay. So uh, that's uh, what I'm looking for. You know, you guys stick around today if you're a Gan fan, or you know some of these uh, legendary master traders from the 30s that did you know all kinds of mathematical formulas before we even had computers. Because Victor Zubarev is going to be with us. And Victor has a real in a very deep knowledge of all of these. He's studied all of these, and Victor has prepared a nice presentation for us. And you know, who knows? Uh, you know, I've never been able to wrap my head around GAN, but it doesn't mean that uh, you, as a trader, may not find that it you know suits your personality. You know, GAN believed time was more important than price. You know, and I say it's not about the if, it's about the when, so that's time. So um, stick around for that interview. Great to be back with all of you. And uh, at this time, I normally pass it on to Blake and uh, see what Blake is thinking uh, before we hand it over to Steve, and then that follows with the interview at the top of the hour. Hey, so, how, hey buddy, how are you? Good. Uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm a little irritated this morning. I got stopped out of the cable, and and what looks to be a stop run too. It's uh, it's so irritating. I'm I'm you know I'm having a hard time, and I said I mentioned this yesterday. I'm having a hard time like um, identifying what to do with the dollar right now. I know I, the dollar's 
pretty confusing. Uh, I don't think there's any real good setups at the moment, but you, you can see the cable. We uh, we actually came below the 618 retracement. This is this yeah. is a pretty classic stop run. I mean, it, yeah. I I sh I I should have known better um, that you know we'd come through here. Hold on, let me grab that. Uh, we come through here through the 618. You know, stop everybody yeah. out and sell, including myself, and then uh, and then bounce. Now, you know, is that it for the cable? I'm, I'm not sure. I, you know, I, I actually shorted some euro pound. You were talking about it a little earlier. I shorted some euro pound on the idea that it that 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 might have been a stop run, but yeah. that's it's a nice bit of retracing, eg, like it, from last well, week. It, well, I'll, I'll I'll take a look at that here in a second. But yeah. you know, I'm not I'm 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 not convinced about the dollar. That's why I'm you know kind of I, I'm going to stay away from the dollar at the moment. And the uh, yen too. What do you do in the end? Like there's so many pairs right now that uh, it looks to me like. They could. I don't know where they're going to go. They could go either way. Well, okay. So the dollar yen. If if you read the analysis, uh, the basic technical analysis from uh, from Forex Analytics overnight, I I I called it the tail of the two six one eight. So um, we're and and it's the same uh, um, in the box the yeah. box that I drew yesterday. But you'll notice that we we retraced six one eight. Stop there. Yeah. We rallied and then retraced to a 618, which we, you know, just shy of basically the, the 618 or just below the 50% retracement. But really, we're kind of stuck in this box. And I, um, you, you, like right now, uh, like 10 year yields are hitting new lows right now. Uh, the dollar yen, I mean, the dollar yen is still, you know, 10 pips off of its lows. Now it is rolling over a little bit. So um, maybe that. That 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 sell-off in, in yields will eventually weigh on the yen, but I, I don't know what to do with the dollar yen. I mean, we we haven't seen risk off yet. If you, if you look at the S and P, the S and P is still above that 28, um, well, 80, 20, 2880. Yeah, I mean that's the the breakout point, right? So yeah. you know, as long as we're still above that 2880, uh, can you get you know? Uh, is it is it a convincing trade to be you know uh, short risk? I don't I don't know if if it really is at this point in time. Um, now if we get below 2880, I think that 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 does change things a little bit. I think you know you have to start being more um, uh, conscientious of a potential risk off as we get that throw over that you 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 often mention on the s p but th that's still you know it's eight points away it, it could you know it could breach today it's possible um but you might have to have good reactions to catch this one blake look at what happened at the beginning of last year that whole break was five days it was it completed that whole decline from early in the year in stock indexes in about five six trading days um at the beginning of the year you mean right here yeah yeah, yeah. beginning of the year this year yeah, yeah. it was and done it, in three four days so it was fast yeah, it was yeah. fast and and i can't remember if there was a catalyst at that point uh or not i am trying to think think you know if if there really was but no one but again, knew why no one but, knew why back then, but think. but what do you do here i mean if there is you know what do you what's what's what do you press? What what's what do you what do you trade? And and again, you know, is it the dollar yen? Uh, do you short the euro yen? Uh, do you short the pound yen? Do you short the Aussie yen? Oops, I just, uh, uh, Aussie yen, Kiwi yen. I mean, you know, Canadian yen. Uh, you know, or do you buy dollars? Is is the dollar the right trade? And I don't know what the answer is, and that's why I'm I'm you know I'm struggling. At this point, to 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 figure out the dollar. Now, technically, like you look at the euro, and you know why the euro stopped where it did. If you if you didn't figure that out this morning, um, we we hit the channel resistance. So, you know, we stopped up at the 116 level. All right, so that's that's pretty easy. Okay, I know why the you know the euro stopped where it did. Um, but does that mean you should be shorting it here? Well, if, if the market rolls over, you know, is is the euro a good short? Maybe the dollar is a good long. It, it again, it's in my opinion, it's not clear um, at this time. And you know, I look at some of these currencies, like you pointed the Aussie. I mean, we, the Aussie made a new trend low here, 
and then we bounced off the lows. Of, it's still 161% extension or 127% extension of this, uh, this, I think this is an August, yeah, this is all the August move consolidation. You know, 127% extension, so should you be getting, you know, short the uh, the Aussie dollar? I don't know. Um, you know, Kiwis uh, made a little false break here below these lows and then we're bouncing, you know, do, do you short the Kiwi? I, you know, I again, I'm not really too sure. So we have to get better clues from the market uh, to identify, you know, what we should be doing. I was, you know, I was looking at Italian bond yields or Italian bonds. Uh, here's the, here's the ten-year bond market, and this is everybody was worried about, you know, Italian bonds last week. Well, look at look at the, you know, bonds have really recovered. So, you know, when you got the, you know, Italian bond market recovering, that takes a lot of pressure off the downside pressure off the euro. So it's like, okay, well, you know, if, if, if you had the Italian bond market breaking down, that would be more of an easy, you know, trade for me. I, I would say, oh, I'll just short the euro yen. You, you know what I mean? But the Italian bond markets, you know, like I said, it's coming, coming off of its lows. So it's, uh, it's taking the downside pressure off. Uh, so again, what do you do? And and that is the question. Right now, there's um, emerging market currencies that are feeling a lot of pressure. Right now, we we're we're seeing um, like you can you can just take a look around it. Um, like here's the U.S. dollar, South African rand blasting higher. Um, U.S. dollar, Mexican peso. We hit a 50% retracement this morning um, of this entire down move. We but we we're pushing higher. Uh, uh, U.S. well, the Turkish lira isn't doing anything. It, it's actually kind of stationary at the moment, but still very well bid. It's not coming off of uh, the highs. So again, this emerging market currency weakness that you're seeing, uh, you know, here's the U.S. dollar CNH still holding up pretty well. Does that, you know, uh, uh, spawn some some risk aversion? And that's possible it, it's possible because that is a, a focal point of a lot of uh, traders and investors right now is is the emerging market currencies and you know are we are we heading into another you know potential crisis there one last thing I, I should mention before uh, you know I turn it over to Steve and Stelios is is the Bank of Canada today so the Bank of Canada uh, we have a you know the the interest rate decision the markets expecting the the BOC to, to, to keep on hold. But because of the inflation pressures that Canada has felt uh, over the last, you know, uh, couple of readings, we're, we're, we're looking for the Bank of Canada to signal that they're going to raise rates next meeting. So by the end of the year. Now, um, the question is how hawkish are they going to sound today? Are they going to, you know, are they going to sound more hawkish or is it going to be more of a dovish hike? And if it's a dovish hike, then we're going to, we're going to plow right through this probably this 132 level, which if you notice is the 618 retracement. Here, let me clean up this chart just a bit here. Um, you can see we broke this down channel, uh, broke through this resistance, and we're just kind of holding right now. Now, if the Bank of Canada signals that they are going to be, you know, raising rates and they, they tend to be a little bit more hawkish, or if they, they, they are a little bit more hawkish, we could see 131 again in the US dollar Canadian we can we can drop right back down to this you know this this channel breakout point which would take us right here to 131 i think this is this would be possible now do keep in mind that the market is waiting uh you know a, a potential nafta agreement and 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 if there is a nafta agreement in principle you know by especially by Mexico and the US and Canada then the risk is going to be of a stronger Canadian dollar as the Bank of Canada is probably gonna you know uh, you know uh, take its foot off the brakes and, and start on a on a on a on an interest rate hike campaign and that but we have to see we have to see some sort of deal uh, NAFTA deal emerge. You know, these talks have been very promising, but we've had, these talks have been ongoing for so long now. And, you know, even even when, um, you know, the, the Trump administration announced that there was going to be a deal with Mexico last week, it never transpired. 
it, it never it never came to fruition it, that was more of a and and we talked about this last week that was more of a uh, uh, I, we needed a win um, so we're going to announce something that really is not even going to happen but you know we wanted to take some of the the uh, the the pressure off of the um, the 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 Michael Cohen indictment and all that stuff I, that's I firmly believe that's what that was at that point and um, I didn't believe there's going to be a, a, a Mexico deal but are they still I say they you know are the the NAFTA negotiators really still inching their way towards some sort of agreement I believe they're I, I have to believe that they're going to do something soon it's going to be you know in the best interest for 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 everyone um, you know, involved to get a uh, some sort of NAFTA deal done, but when's that going to get done? And but when it does, I think the dollar Canadian will fall. Um, but you know, again, does it does it happen today, or you know, does it happen two months from now? Who knows? Uh, but the dollar Canadian, you got to watch it here. If 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 we if if they if they signal that um, you know it's pretty much a done deal next next meeting, and we're going to get a hike, and and it sounds like they the the Bank of uh, uh, Canada is going to take the um, m less conservative route and just talk about, um, you know, uh, that they have to start raising rates soon. Then the dollar Canadian could give back some of these gains that we've seen over the last um, over the last several trading sessions since last week. So we got to watch the, the Canadian careful. And I think if we break break above these highs, above this 132, um, this 132 level, 132.05, then that that will allow uh, continued gains up towards 133. So we have to be very, very careful with the uh, the Canadian today during the Bank of Canada interest rate decision. Um, uh, I, I guess really fast, uh, before I turn it over to Steve, is, um, you know, I have to also mention that the, um, the that, this, and and I don't typically take a look at these, but man, these cryptocurrencies really broke down uh, here. Uh, you see the 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 U.S. dollar, or uh, excuse me, the Bitcoin market slipped right to channel support. Um, uh, Ethereum broke below uh, out of its triangle and broke to new trend lows. I was expecting uh, a move towards a uh, uh, you know uh, 240. You can see the analysis from earlier today on Ethereum. Uh, when we broke that triangle, the Ethereum broke lower out of the four-hour triangle, which targeted new trend lows uh, near 240. And uh, we, we, we got as low as 250, but I don't think uh, you're out of the woods yet with, with Ethereum. Ethereum looks like we're going to break down towards the uh, 223 level. Now, one, one, I guess one last thing, and Steve, Steve, will, uh, Steve will probably chime in here in a bit. We're, we've got a blog uh, coming out about uh, precious metals, and I'm not going to go – into too much detail today, but or, or right at this moment in time. But I'll, I'll tell you, gold has been holding up a lot better than silver. Silver hit a new trend low, and in, inside of this uh, this this down channel. But the one thing that I'd be looking at now is if silver actually ends up turning and breaking this channel resistance. Because if it breaks channel resistance, then that 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 would actually be a signal for me to start looking at gold longs again and because gold has held up really well I think this uh, the shakeout from Asia a couple of weeks back is a uh, it, it was it was a was a, a true low um, near term so I think it could be traded against uh, I'm even though I'm not long gold at the moment I am really strongly considering uh, picking up some gold soon uh, once again because I did play it on the long side uh, coming through this channel out of this channel and I, I, I'm thinking about buying it again here very shortly uh, matter of fact Steve Stelios are, are you are you guys uh, are you guys logged in I like your 618 there Blake at about 118058 hello oh, I'm here yeah yeah hey guys how you doing I'm very good very good thank you Good, good. Um, so uh, we, we, you know, we had we had some moves in the dollar. The dollar strengthened overnight. Uh, obviously, we've pulled back a little bit. The euros bounced. The cables bounced off of the lows. Um, now, uh, there's there's been some headlines regarding the UK Stelios. I'm not sure if you saw them overnight, um, but really the 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 last outstanding um, uh, issue that they're looking to uh, 
looking to 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 tackle for in the Brexit negotiations, which is the big one right now, is uh, the Irish border. But it looks like they've got most of the most of the other boxes checked at this point. You know, Blake, you're absolutely right. And the more I hear the headlines and the more I read what people are saying, the more I just don't understand why the pound is still down here, you know, compared to the dollar, compared to euro and everything. And even Merkel, uh, Angela Merkel, uh, I saw a headline like half an hour ago where she said something along the lines of uh, a, an agreement has to be made. It's in the interest of everybody or something like that, you know. And, and this is this is all very constructive in my opinion. And I, I just don't understand what are, what the markets are waiting for. Are they waiting for confirmation that the deal is done? Probably. Because, you know, I would, assume, seen, I would this, assume that would be it. Is, yeah. is, is, is they're looking for a deal to be finished and yeah. final. Yeah, I mean, they, they, just like you said, you know, they, if you look at what Trump has said, he, he practically announced the the the, um, uh, the deal with Mexico, and then nothing happened. So that might be the the reason. You know, if, if you know, if, if you had asked me, I I would have thought that this these headlines and these issues and just one main issue left that that, that would have that should have pushed the pound higher. I mean, that's that really is worrying me a little bit. But I can only assume, like we said before, is that they're waiting for the deal to actually be done and to see what the what they what the details are. Right. So that, that was all PR guys with Mexico last week. I Nothing think it was tangible. Okay. No. I think I think it was you know you know that it was the same day. It was actually a couple hours after um uh uh Michael Cohen oh, Kern. and and Manafort. Yeah, but we're both okay. taken to jail. So I think it was it was uh it was a hey we need a checkbox we need a checkbox a win. Yeah. Uh for the administration, let's announce something that's yeah. crazy. It doesn't matter if it's true or untrue. It just, you know, it was taking the limelight off of uh, indictments, and I, I, I firmly believe it because it was just a couple hours later. And I'm like, and 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 you know, following that, Mexico is like, uh, no, we don't. This is the first thing, first time we've heard of anything about this. And Canada is like, what, what, you know, us too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. I mean, like and, you said it on the webinar, and you absolutely nailed it. Was absolutely yeah. right. And and you know, there, then you had everybody that was shorting the US dollar Mexican peso down here thinking that a deal's gonna be done. And I'm like, uh, not so fast, guys, you know, and, and obviously you can see where the peso's at now uh, as a result. I mean, we've gone from eighteen seventy to, to nineteen seventy, which you know, that's a that's a big that's a that, that's a full, you know, big figure move in the peso, which is a big move. Um, okay. you know. Hopefully you weren't, or no one was stuck, you know, on the on the on the receiving end of that because that that smelled very fishy to me. But anyway, no, um, no but I did buy Paul Manafort's karaoke machine. Nice, very nice. <laughs> All right, well, hey, I'm going to pass it over. To Steve. Uh, good morning, Steve. Uh, by the way, I'm going to be passing it over to you because we have, uh, Canadian trade data coming out, and I'm going to uh, get ready to trade. So, good hunting, Blake. Good luck, guys. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck. Thanks, guys. Hey, Dave. Hey, it's Steve. Uh, you know, I, I just wanted to make sure people were that came for Pauly. Some I just saw some messages. They were looking for the European cross dresser session. <laughs> 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 I told them <laughs> you would provide the link. All right, buddy. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, so sorry, I'm, I'm not on, I'm not on my main computer, so I don't have the link on uh, this one. But I, I, I promise right. you, know, I'm going to make it up to you. <laughs> all right, buddy. Um, uh, okay, so um, you know, during the next few days, because I I, I need to do some platforming to format my computer, I'm, I I will have to be broadcasting to my MacBook because, as it ends up, you know, something is really messed up with uh, Go to Webinar software and my Windows. So when Go to Webinar software is on. You know, uh, my my connection to my computer just gets destroyed immediately. So uh, you know, uninstalling, reinstalling, and everything didn't do the trick. So formatting will have to be done. But you know, there is a lot of software there and things. So I need to first you know put everything in order. Uh, so for the next few days, I'm going to be on my MacBook. So I would appreciate your help, Stelio, with uh, questions, etc. Since I don't have the luxury of having multiple screens uh, on this one. Um, now. Um, I know we talked a lot about NAFTA and you know some some of the pairs here. So uh, let me first go through uh, the USDMXN because the USDMXN plays really perfectly to what we had in mind here. This is exactly what we drew. 
Um, you know, when the pair was breaking higher, perhaps we get a rejection from here, another correction lower and the move higher, everything transpired in this exact way, but you know, uh, the, the pace was not the one I drew. Um, let me say here that I believe that there is also the potential that the USDMXN is gonna make it even higher. Like, you know, towards perhaps uh, if if this failure from the 50% fee, but 1969 doesn't prove to be enough, perhaps we make it up to 20. Um, why? That's that's a confluence of a horizontal resistance area and the 61.8 of the move lower. Um, regardless, though, I would expect that this move, um, you know, we, we will actually turn over and, you know, we're going to start heading um, lower once again. So, um, you know, I just wanted to add that for this pair. Now, now let's let's go ahead and have a look at the metals. Um, I, I've I've started adding to my gold position. I now have a two third of a regular position size uh, long. So um, I'm still uh, positive about gold. I still think that uh, you know there is a very decent chance and you know a very respectable reward to risk ratio that uh, we're actually going to be moving higher from here. Um, so um, let me by the way kill Skype. So you don't have to see the messages. Okay. Um, so um, I do think that there is a good potential that we're going to be higher once again. Um, I, I would be looking for the 38.2 at 1238. And as I said, and you know, Blake said that we're going to get out a post about that. We will. Uh, but as I said yesterday. I would very much like to see a divergence with uh, silver. So, you know, I, I was expecting that silver, you know, would be plunging lower because the price action was feeling very heavy. I mean, this is a recovery that we had, in essence, didn't change much for the bearish trend. Um, but, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if I saw some kind of a capitulation here. Um, especially if we stall here, we, we even have like very considerable RSI divergence. Uh, the previous low that we saw in silver uh, brought RSI very close to 20. RSI is currently at 30. So this is uh, what I would like to see. Now, yesterday, uh, we talked about oil. And, you know, I very specifically said that, you know, it looks likely that we're going to be headed to new highs. But I think that the pullback is due. Um, and we got that magnificent candle yesterday. This is a huge outside black candle. So that's a very, very bearish candle. Now, let me make it clear. I First of all, we didn't end up closing on a daily closing basis above this 70 area. So, you know, uh, yesterday we were, uh, you know, uh, much higher during the webinar and taking into account that perhaps, not perhaps, that most likely we would close above 70. I said that, you know, a close above 70, uh, you know, definitely makes me bullish. And you know, no, you know, depends on how how high we push before we pull back. So let's say ideally we make it to 72.56, and then we pull back. Then we can, you know, uh, expect 70 to act as support. But the issue is that you know we had a very very bullish day, which completely reversed and closed on the lows. So you know, this is a game changer because we never closed above uh, the 70 um, resistance area. And actually, this is a very, very bearish candle. So, of course, you know, I'm, I'm not excluding the possibility that, uh, you know, um, we will still, uh, you know, keep acting in a bullish manner. But I would definitely not want to see like momentum in this reversal. So, yes, this reversal candle was very bearish. Now, if we do see some momentum uh, building up, I will then go. back to my main scenario because if you remember as as proof that i'm not all at all convinced you know that we we don't yet have at least one more leg lower but 70 is the line for the, you know the line in the sand for me if we if we actually make it above it um then you know i have to turn bullish again because anyhow my medium to long-term bias is bullish so this is a game changer as i said i'm, I'm expecting to see what's going to happen the, during the next couple of days if we gain some momentum uh, i'm on, not only going to be looking for a retest of this uh, horizontal support area, but I'm, I might be looking for another push lower. I might even sell it. Uh, but as I said, I need a little bit more price action. Definitely, yes, this candle was a very bearish one and one that you should not um, uh, dismiss. So use the knock. Let's see how uh, you know use the knock react to that. Ideally, I would want to see one more move to the downside before higher for use the knock. Obviously, if crude gets destroyed. 
and we don't have some other news, that's not going to help in that scenario. And especially considering the fact that, you know, there is absolutely no question this is a bullish breakout on the USD card. It's not only the fact that we actually did break above this uh, descending channel, it's that we did it with momentum. It's that, you know, the descending channel was clearly... Uh, Uh, you know, um, a formation that was, uh, by all, um, you know, interpretations, it, it is corrective. So I think that any pullback, you know, towards the 131 area is probably a gift. Um, and, you know, the next uh, area of interest is up at 133. Now, there are a few indices that is very, very much worth looking at. First of all, yesterday we got rejected from this, uh, you know, in NASDAQ from uh, this um, wedges resistance. Obviously, I need to see a lot more. Uh, to, to to get on board, for example, 7,470, which is like these previous highs, also the wedge support, that's the area I would see, I would want to see the, uh, you know, the index break uh, for me to start getting warm about the possibility that we've, we've actually found the top. Until then, you know, I'm very cautious. I mean, you can always see a few days like of weakness, but, you know, you need to see a lot more than that. But the index that's actually at a very, very critical stage is the DAX. I already spoke about that, I think, yesterday again. Um, why? Because there are only two areas, two, two levels left for DAX before we get a, a major, major long-term term technical break. One of them is the one we're currently testing, this horizontal support area at 12,100. So you want to buy the DAX? This is probably a nice area to do it because you have a very clearly defined reward to risk ratio. But if, you know, if this breaks, then you know, there's nothing much. I mean, there's thin there until we actually reach 11,800. And as I said yesterday, 11,800 is the neckline of this huge switch. Honestly speaking, if we break below it, um, I think that the bulls will have a very, very tough time um, getting out of the market unscathed. Um, so, DAX, I'm close to monitoring this area and uh, after that, 11,800 is, you know, the line in the sand, the bulber line, as we like to call it in Forex analytics. Now, FXI is something that's also uh, of interest uh, because those are, you know, the large cap uh, stocks in China. You know, we had that bearish move lower, you know, following what all indices more or less did. We then had a triangle. I was saying that, you know, I expect a triangle to break. Uh, to the downside, uh, you know, expecting that we're going to see at least one more leg lower. But, you know, what interest is, interests me more is, is what has, has been happening since. And what is that? We're seeing some price action that looks like a consolidation. It's choppy. It looks corrective. You can define it as a, an expanding triangle. Perhaps it will, you know, become a diamond, a continuation diamond formation. RSI also shows more or less characteristics of a correction because RSI has been slowly recovering, uh, but definitely isn't showing any, uh, after having, as, as Dale would call it, after having a confirmed low uh, down here at 20, when we found that low RSI was more or less at 20. Um, so RSI has recovered since, but in all honesty, this, this chart you know, makes me think that you know, we're not done. We're not done pushing lower and you know, with whatever that means for the rest of the indices. Now, let's have a look at the FTSE. FTSE, we said yesterday, a couple of uh, different interpretations here. One of them is definitely um, that this is still corrective. And I think, you know, I still think that there is a high chance that this move is corrective, uh, barely holding this horizontal support area. But even if we make it a little bit lower, perhaps this proves to be a channel instead of a bottom, uh, of a flat bottom triangle, right? So, um, you know, if I want to show an index, uh, FTSE wouldn't be my first priority, probably. If I was looking to buy some indices, FTSE would be, uh, you know, high in my list of, of, um, of priorities. Um, I remember, let me see. Because unfortunately, I'm on my MacBook and this is a small screen. Uh, yeah, JPN 225. So uh, one more thing I wanted to talk about. We we've, uh, we've mentioned multiple times, and this is something that once again proves the choppiness of uh, you know that you know the USD yen has been suffering from uh, because you know at the same time the Nikkei fails to do something 
Nikki is trapped between this ascending trend lines. How far back it dates? It dates all. Uh, in 2016 but at the same time uh, we cannot also doubt the potency of this horizontal resistance area 23,000. we made an attempt last week to actually break above it but it was a failed attempt and we're back again in you want to call it a range between 22,000 and 23,000. you want to call it a triangle you know we're back again below it so um this is one of the reasons why i wouldn't be holding my breath expecting the USD yen to do something. I actually think that it's extremely tedious. And they actually think that, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's it's probably loss of uh, uh, sleep and capital to try to trade it. I mean, once again, it's finding some resistance in this whole horizontal resistance area. Uh, you can see here at 111.50, but it has become so choppy. I mean, you really don't have any clear bias of what's happening here. So I, I don't, really bother with it i mean until uh, until it starts doing something once again I, I i won't really bother um going to the dx uh, the dxy nice rebound seems to be losing some momentum um i'm an advocate of perhaps one more push lower i mean i would want to see at least one more push lower for the dxy even if it proves to be bullish in the medium term in the short term it feels like you know there is at least uh, one more leg lower so uh, but you know, until that happens, who knows what's going to transpire? For example, let me let me explain what I mean. We might spend some time consolidating here and then move lower, or we might do something like this, like push a little bit lower, then push higher once again towards let's say 96, <clears throat> and then push lower. So until that happens, you know, it's a little bit tricky trading, you know, the vast majority of the dollar pairs because you know the dollar is currently trapped and you know these kind of corrective moves or consolidation moves um can end up lasting you know more days than you expect initially they might you know within whatever formation they build they might produce some short-lived sharp sharp moves that get people trapped you know in either direction so uh, you know I, I would be a little bit careful here i mean um i think that you know, there are periods of time that you go all in. For example, I remember, you know, when we had those nice trends in January, etc. I, I was finding myself, you know, having a lot more positions than I usually have. Now I'm extremely light because it just came from vacation. But most importantly, because as I said, there are many things that, you know, I haven't cleared up yet, you know, the technical uh, viewpoint. So, you know, there's no reason to push your luck. But let's go through looking a few pairs that are on some you know interesting levels one of them is uh the pound kiwi and why is that because the pound kiwi it has been trapped in a symmetrical triangle for quite some earlier today but you know this attempt so far has failed you know given the fact that we entered the symmetrical triangle from the downside uh I think it's a lot more fitting to to make to the upside. So I would tend to believe a lot more a break to the upside than one to the downside. I would be more skeptical. So I have to say that you know that might have been so far a false break, but I'm I'm you know I'm looking at the possibility of a break higher, uh, you know, as a very likely one. So um, you know I think this is something that you know is, is worth perhaps. Uh, trading um pound um uh, you know choppy i just see it here retesting like a, a previous trend line um after failing in in this uh, resistance area at 179.50 uh, obviously uh, pound kiwi looks a lot more likely to make a move to the upside before uh, pound does it that so if you're looking to belong one of those two pairs i think that pound kiwi uh you know technically speaking uh, much clearer Uh, you know, and much trade with the proper uh, reward to risk ratio, etc. Now, let's have a look at the euros in the Euro Kiwi. Those have been quite strong. There's no question about it. Just look, look at Euro Kiwi, uh, at Euro Aussie. It's consolidating right at the previous highs. Um, there is no question about it. The move higher so far has been quite strong. Um, if we do manage 
hard to clear uh, this zone to the upside. The next uh, target is the 127% extension of this um, uh, of this um, corrected move lower at 164.40. Someone can even make the case here that this is an inverted head and shoulders formation that has been triggered. You know, there are there are two points of view here. There are people that believe that head and shoulders patterns are clearly and purely um, reversal patterns. And, I, you know, I'm more of that opinion, but there are, you know, a lot of traders, respectable traders that also view them as continuation patterns. Um, you know, I'm not so much of a believer of that, but anyhow, I'm just mentioning it since, you know, it's here. Um, but I've anyway, become on, I've become on Steve because I, you know, I used to be, you know, some of us technicians get a little too anal, you know, and we get, uh, we become technical analysts because we're so anal about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Why not be open and go, Hey, you know, I've seen it work as a continuation formation a hundred times. Yeah, I guess it is a possibility. Huh? From from what I see, from what I see, every single joke um, uh, that you have today is kinky one way or another. Yeah, what's wrong? <laughs> what's wrong with me? What what did my vacation do to me? Huh? I don't know. You, you I, have I had a, I had a lot of adventures. I had, I had I didn't go to any place exotic, but I had a lot of adventures. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I, I've seen them work long enough not to fight it anymore, Steve, because I used to yeah. debate people. I was on the purist Edwards and McGee technical analysis of stock trends, you know, camp, like, you know, that was my gospel. But, yeah, uh, people use them effectively. Now but I have a question for you, Coach. Yeah. What do you think about the Euro Kiwi? Because I, I have to be honest here. If there is one pair that I find extremely hard to read and very tricky, is the Euro Kiwi. Why? Because at the same time that it's pushing to new highs, first of all, let, let me mention that we got a nice rejection today from the 161.8% extension of the yeah. last corrective lower. So I would be very, very careful being long up here. So, you yeah. know, this is the first reason why I'm having a look at it. But the second thing that, you know, the, the thing that actually bothers me here, and that's why I, I didn't even consider, uh, you know, trading it, is the fact that look at this price action. I mean, this price action, if you didn't know what was happening earlier, if you didn't know that we actually now pushed to a new high, I would definitely view it as corrective anyway. Very okay. choppy, takes a long time to, to, to unfold. Um, yeah. very slow grinding, and grinding, yeah. And despite yeah. breaking to new highs, not doing it in a convincing manner, right? Well, so, maybe on, maybe on a weekly, it's approaching, uh, besides your 1.618, something that's more visible when you look left if you look on your weekly. Listen, I have absolutely no problem having a look at it, so let's go to the weekly. And have a look at it. So there we go. That is a good oh, point. Right. That is a good point. There's nothing impulsive in any of that action. Okay. So this is what I had yeah. on the weekly. Yeah. I was expecting that perhaps this would fail lower, but you know, you have to respect the possibility for a push higher. Yeah. But you see, I mean. I don't know. I'm. I'm really I don't like the divergence it. between the two highs, the one made in August or September, yeah. and the so, one we're so making far, now. So far, a very obvious divergence, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so at the most, I'm neutral. I'm not. I'm not chasing this. Uh, you know, to to be long. Speaking here. of the weekly, perhaps there is an alternative interpretation here, and the alternative interpretation could be on the weekly that this was. A four. Triangle. Yeah, and this is five. Yeah. Yeah. This terminal. Was a triangle terminal. Terminal. That we actually broke some time ago. Yeah. And yeah. now we are actually, but even even using that interpretation, I wouldn't. Be be chasing it up here in all honesty I don't like it I wouldn't be chasing it long of course but definitely I'm not putting my money on that being on the long side uh, now um, you um, yeah I mentioned yesterday about the possible rebound of the USD Swiss 
Uh, I just want to say that today we're testing the 200 VMA and you know the 9750 resistance. So uh, in all honesty, this is nice rebound so far, but we really need to clear this level to the upside uh, for me to get uh, more enthusiastic since we didn't cover that pair. I mean, like didn't cover that pair before. I think um, you know I, I just want to. Um, Stelio, this is a good point in time to tell me if, if there are any questions we haven't covered, mate. Uh, Steve, first of all, I have some bad news for you. You are getting the lag effect again on the Mac, but only a little bit, so like two or three seconds. So it's kind of bearable, but I must say something's wrong in your house. You must move house, okay? Okay, so questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, on a, I'm on a Wi-Fi, so that's I'm on a Wi-Fi, so that's not like extremely surprising, to be honest. Yeah, actually, there's a friend. Our friend Stephen has some comments, which I will pass on to you afterwards. Thank you, Stephen. Um, on your uh, on your MacBook, that is. Okay, uh, you covered some indices. Did you cover the FTSE uh, today? Hello. There's a lag. Oh, it's particularly bad this time. And this is off his Mac. Yeah, it's not okay. So he's not his Windows machine. Seriously, I don't, I don't get it because he has the same internet connection as I do, and it's very, yeah. fa it's fast. There he is. Steve. Oh dear Lord. Okay, something's wrong here. Oh, he's uh, <laughs> he can clearly hear us. Okay. But, well, you know, my my guest is Victor is here. Okay. If we want to just uh, move ahead. Just give me a minute so I could get ready for Victor, and we'll just yeah, start the in, we'll just start the interview a little earlier. I mean, this is live TV, man. We 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 have to <laughs> we have to be ready for anything that could happen. I mean, we could get news alerts, and you know. Uh, you and I are like Huntley and Brinkley uh, when we're on together, and or yeah. uh, you know. Anyway, um, Victor, I mean, thanks for joining us. Oh, there he is. Okay. okay. No, no, I was just I was just being silent for some time, just checking my connection, etc. You know, speed test doesn't show anything uh, weird or different, so I, I don't know what to say. I can tell you as a fact that you go to webinar is now like completely messing up my window. You see, I mean, the moment I start speaking there. Uh, everything stalls, but you know, I'm having to do my MacBook. Book. I don't know. I've I've spoken to my provider. You know, everything works perfectly on anything else besides go to webinar. So I don't know what to do. In all honesty, I don't. Uh, so anyhow, if you can hear me now without any lags, tell you you can keep on giving me questions and we can go over them. Yeah, uh, I mean, there was a question about the FTSE. I know you covered some indices. I can't remember. Yes, if I, you did, covered I did the cover. I did the cover the um, Dave, what Dave else? is asking about Palladium. Oh sure, yeah, let's have a look at palladium, yeah. and we can also have. Palladium. A, uh, we have platinum and copper as well by uh, our another friend. So maybe those three, and then we take it to the interview. Sure, and you know something, we can also have a look because I wanted to talk about, uh, forgot about it, about some of the exotics. So, palladium, currently testing the 1,000 level. Uh, I expect that the chance of a reaction from here is quite high. So obviously, buying up here, confluence of the 200 DMA and horizontal horizontal resistance area, not a smart idea. So I would be very, very careful up here. So this is one point um, about palladium. So, you know, I, I, I don't, I mean, it looks, it looks by far the most bullish of all the metals, uh, but, you know, buying it up there makes no sense. Platinum, extremely bearish, uh, got rejected once again from this uh, triangle support as resistance. And as you see, it's trading more or less in the same manner that silver was trading before I said that I expected to make a new low. So I'm going to say the same thing about platinum here. The way I see platinum, it looks like it wants to break lower and, uh, you know, and resume to the downside. So it's as simple as that. I mean, there is nothing in this price action that says, okay, we are about to find the bottom uh, in, in platinum. I need to see something totally different. Now, I have opened the four area of resistance, review support resistance. Also, I said that if we make it above here, it can even get higher towards 294. But if we fail from here, you know, you can expect a move uh, lower, and that move lower 
I expect that the next area of support that it might find is at 247, whatever it is, 246, 244, actually, sorry, 244.60. Um, so copper as well doesn't look that healthy. So I expect it to, uh, to also um, resume lower. Now, um, let's have a look at a few of the exotics because the vast majority of them are actually at, at interesting levels. One of them, the USD rubble. This is a textbook triangle. We're very close to resistance. Um, I have an equality target from the first move higher uh, until the end of that triangle that points to 71.17. As a quality target, just below that, we find a 50% FIB from the high that we had like a couple of years ago when was it last year, um, summer it was as well. Um, I, I think that, you know, this is a nice area to be looking for at least one more thrust uh, after getting out of uh, this triangle. So I do suspect that the triangle is, is going to break to the downside to, to be exact. Exact. Now, uh, use the Turkish Lira. Um, many scenarios here. I think you know there is an appealing uh, you know reward to risk ratio. Um, if if you want to be uh, short for some more consolidation within this range, let me reiterate here. I'm not looking for a reversal in the USD Turkish lira, but I do think that there is a possibility that we're going to spend some time uh, below the uh, high that we had, uh, just above seven before we actually penetrate through and we make it above. So, you know, uh, if we do hold this area, more choppiness like a triangle, perhaps it's going to turn out, out to be what the USD rubble has created. Um, or we might even see one more push to lower, you know, lower than this low before resuming to the upside. Uh, so I think from a risk reward ratio, uh, hoping for, uh, you know, a little bit more of uh, Turkish lira strength before uh, getting disintegrated once again is something that might work. Now, uh, USD ZAR, um, I had the confluence of resistances. I, I made very clear uh, that this is a pennant and I expect the pennant to break to the, to the upside. Um, my, uh, my actually target was here at 1540 because we had, um, you know, confluence of resistances, 127% extension and the 61.8. And since we made it above this, or we, we look, you know, we seem to be making it above that. I have to say that I also have a confluence of uh, resistances at 16.45. So, uh, you know, so, so far, so good, it, it still looks quite bullish. It all starts, you know, we were talking about before that inverted head and shoulders um, formations um, are mostly ex uh, um, accepted as reversal formations. So this is an example of a head and shoulders formation that acted perfectly as a reversal formation. And, you know, use these are, let me zoom out further. Yeah, we're, we've lost you again, Steve. Well, it's interview time now. Anyway. Yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. You can tell you're, you're one of the CEOs. <laughs> no, let's, yeah, let's, let's go ahead with the interview. You can see here, um, ah. you know, each. Yeah, Steve, that was a big, big one. I'm like here, the really? ones on your, on, yeah, that was a big one, like on your PC. So we have to, we have to address this problem. Okay, let's uh, yeah. let's let's get on with the interview, and then I'll have a chat to Steve and see what we can do. Okay, thank you guys. Okay. All right, hi Victor. Thank you. Yeah. thank you for coming back for the third time. You know I like the number three, so I'm making you the presenter. Look forward to hearing your voice again, buddy. And I know you prepared something with us with some people that uh, were market masters in the 30s and 50s. And looking forward to talking to you. It's been a while. Yeah, Dale, it's been about almost a year since the, oh. the last interview. 
Oh, time flies while you're trying to pick a top in the S&P. Oh, I know. And, you know, you picked a really good intro because uh, the number three, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, the uh, law of three and the law of seven. Oh, great. The law you of know. vibration. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, I read your, uh, what you talked, uh, what you wrote on Twitter about what you were going to cover. And, you know, I appreciate when people put some time and preparation into uh, bringing, you know, great educational content and i've been saying this is a don't miss it so you know what i'm going to do what i normally don't do i'm going to shut up and okay. i'm going to let you talk and uh and learn well, let me uh, uh uh before i get started with that um i'm going to be using uh screenshots of um images that i posted last night on twitter so if i go to this screen here do you do you see this screen right mm -hmm. here Okay, Apple. let me try something. Let me try something. This is the Apple Daily Chart, which I'll go over with you at the end. I okay. kind of have a a, um, a a loose agenda, uh, but it's it's been intriguing for me because I discovered it. I mean, I discovered this 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 challenge or this journey um, probably a month ago when I was uh, looking into what. Uh, Gan really meant by the by the term law of vibration, which he uses in a ticker interview with White Whitescoff back in oh. 1909, I believe. It's called the famous ticker interview. You can look it up. Anybody can go on, uh, you know, Google and look it up. Just Google, uh, you know, the uh, Gan Whitescoff ticker interview. Is it audio see. only? Uh, it's just a. It's it's just a. Re uh, they're, they're, they're quotes and reprints of, oh, I see. Okay, so it's written. of the summary. Okay. Uh, it's not a video. It's yeah, just, I mean, 1909, they didn't even have it. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a um, – the, the reason I, I put these images together to show you is because uh, one step led to another along this journey, and it ended up that – uh, what I would call theoretical or hypothetical scientific uh, 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 thoughts and uh, uh, ideas actually led to another step, which I'm now going to, at the very end, use this Apple chart as, a, as an example. I'm going to use one other chart as well of the ESs on how I interpret what Gan was trying to tell us when he uh, talks about the um, law of vibration in his book, The Tunnel Through the Air. So let me go to this other screen here. Okay. Uh, can't go down here. Show you a minute. Sorry. Give me one second. Okay. Take your time. Uh, yeah. Okay, here we go. I'm going to put the the um, the cover of the book on the uh, on the screen for you. There you go. Wow! Airplanes falling out of the sky. Right, Tunnel airplanes falling out of the sky. It, it almost it almost looks like a, um, a when you read when you read the book. When I first got this book, and I read it the first time around, I thought this is this is junk. This is nothing but a, a romance novel. Uh, uh, melded into a sci-fi novel because there's a uh, there's a sci-fi fiction type of uh, theme going through it, and I'm going this 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 ain't gonna work for me. It's not going to give me any additional training uh, technique information that I I could really use. But in this book, the book is coded, and uh, Gan even says in the introduction that. Uh, he suggests that you read this book three times. The number three comes up again, just like you mm. mentioned in the opening. And yeah. then he says you will you will you'll you'll begin to see things that you hadn't seen before in the book. And so what I'm going to do um, is read a portion of the book uh, in chapter seven, on page seventy seven of chapter seven. Uh, it's the only time that Gan mentions, the law of vibration in the book, The Tunnel Through the Air. And I'm going to read you this part because this part, I think, is a big clue. 
he says that in my, making my calculations on the stock market or any future event, I get the past history and find out what cycle we are in and then predict the curve for the future, which is a repetition of past market movements. And here's where he says the next sentence is, the great law of vibration is based on like producing like. Like causes uh, produce like effects. And uh, he goes on to mention the wireless telegraph, the phonograph and the radio. So he was into, at that point in time, uh, cycles. And this is, I think, a clue to what he's talking about in the law of vibration. Now, uh, there's another book that came out by Tony Plummer. It's called The Law of Vibration, where he has the subtitle of the book, The Revelation of William D. Gann. And here he talks about the linkage between the wording, the law of vibration, the law of three, the law of seven. He brings up the fact that Gurdjieff, the uh, Armenian Russian mystic, uh, in the early 1900s, also wrote books that were coded. And uh, he brings those those two guys together. Um, and one of the better books that I've read on uh, the um, Gurdjieff uh, link and Gan is the following, and I'll go to that right now. Just give me a second. So these are universal laws that he discovered to apply to the markets. I think so. I think he discovered that um, uh, if if you know that the uh, cycles work in all time frames and um, in, in all instances throughout the universe, uh, then you uh, will have a key to an understanding of how the markets move from uh, you know point A to point B, from pivot high to pivot lows. Okay. And uh, let me just get this going here. And you also mentioned another guy, uh, Stephen. It starts with Stephen. a P, huh? Yeah, P, yeah, Stephen. Uh, his name is pretty funny to pronounce because if you first look at it, it's uh, it looks like you should say the name is. Uh, P U E T Z putts, but I think he yeah. probably goes by pites okay. or some other variation. Now I posted a video, uh, video uh, uh, he did on YouTube uh, last night, and you can look, you can look at my uh, uh, Twitter feed, and uh, he's interviewed for about 50 minutes, he, and he talks about his his uh, theory about the unified cycle theory, which has it's an amazing book. It's over 450 pages long, which I'll go through. Wow. And he talks about cycles as long as billions of years to as short as uh, 28 days. That's what huh. caught my eye. But um, he uh, he mentions that the uh, cycles have a habit of uh, pu uh, putting together uh, linkages uh, in groups of three. Here's your number three again. That's why I wanted to bring that up to you. Huh. Here's the yeah, there are right lot, yeah, there are a lot of, you know, popular things, you know, the third time's a charm or the third planet from the sun. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? The hat trick is three goals. There are a lot of threes out there, you know, even, you know, the Trinity. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just by, you know, accident came to believe it was a number of completion. Well, the number of completion could be nine and it could be zero. Uh, also, okay. the number, uh, the number uh, in numerology, yeah, you know, in numerology, the number nine not only is the number of completion, but it's the number of initiation, which I'm going to show you next, okay. um, because I think it's very interesting that what this guy Tony Plummer did, he linked uh, the uh, the uh, Gan emblem, which is the circle and the square and the triangle all in, in one setting um, with the enneagram, which also is a moving object image uh, that um, is constantly changing. And I'm going to show you that image right now. Okay. Yeah, let me find it. Coming up, John. Okay, here we go. This this is a this is a great a great um, 
this is a great uh, port portrait of the Enneagram, which is spelled E-N-N-E-A-G-R-A-M. And okay. it's from a book that uh, Christian Wurtenbarker wrote. And if anybody's interested in more about discovering how Gurdjieff actually coded this image into his works, uh, this is the book to get. Um, if you notice, uh, Dale, there's a nine at the very top. See that there? Right, yes. You see my little finger there? Okay. Yeah. That is the number uh, that is linked with the sacred triangle three, six, and nine. I've got to get back down here. Okay, three, six, and nine. In this example, the way the movement of these numbers is uh, goes is that it's not actually moves from one, then the two, then the three, then the four, then the five, then the six, and so on, until you get to nine, and then you start over. Actually, the number starts like this. It starts with a one here. It drops to four. It doesn't go to two next. It drops from one to four, then from four to two, then from two to eight, and then from eight to five, and then from five to seven, and then finally, the last link is seven to one, and then the whole cycle repeats. Now, according to Tony Plummer, this is the secret to the markets, because what he did next is the following, um, and you're gonna see why. So I'm gonna jump ahead here and go to this. Um, this actually is another um, image of the same thing we just talked about. If we start at one, we go to right. four, then we go to two, then we go to eight, then we go to five. I'm sorry, five is right. Five is right there. I've cut it off. Uh, then, um, then we go to seven, and then we finally go back up to one, and the cycle starts over again. If you notice the one and the eight is in the position of a like a double top, and there's a you can draw a horizontal line across here. Interesting. Uh, and there's a reason for it. So what Tony Plummer says is, if you take the this diagram and uh, convert it into something that looks like this, and you have a creative shock here. This is where wave one, let's say you're talking about uh, Elliott wave. Wave one is, uh, it would start here, correct? So yeah. there's something that happened here that created the initial impulse. So what he does, he believes that uh, cycles don't work in uh, the way Elliott would say, it would be uh, you know the one, two, three, four, five, uh, up and then you know uh, ABC right. down and then uh, the recycles. He says you want, you want to look at one, two, three up and ABC down. Interesting. Uh, if, you, if you remember what what we did, we we yeah, went the from one. The obligation would say that's all corrective. That's right. Okay. But but what what I remember and I can't remember the author's name. There's a book at the Cleveland Public Library by some Forex author where he also claimed the same thing. Don't think about uh, analyzing your market uh, in terms of Elliott Wave uh, uh, procedures, but uh, that the markets move in a, a one, two, three up pattern, and then it corrects in a one, two, three down pattern. And if you if you think about it, this one is the um, this right here is the shock. This right here, right here. Passive, passive okay. shock. Yeah, it's 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 uh it's the initiation stage. It's okay. the initial one, but it jumps back down to two, uh, uh, or four rather. And four is. I'll show you where four is on here. Four is right here. It's a new high, new high, and then uh. uh the correction phase is the uh, correction phase would be starting here, eight, five, seven, and then back to one. But basically, you want to be aware of this pattern right here, which is what Plummer's theory is based on. And I want to I wanted to mention something to you because I'm going to cover the. Uh, an interesting aspect of W. D. Gann and his uh, secret book that he wrote called uh, "The Ancient Science of Number," secret science of uh, numbers, and he used an uh, alias. He used uh, the name of Luo Clement, 
L-U-O is the first name. And that always right. bothered me because I thought, why would someone uh, bother to go to that extent and not just spell his first name as L, you know, L-O-U for Lou? And there's a reason for it. And um, I'll go over that with you. But this, the, the main reason for it I will go over is, is also based on the fact that um, the numbers that are linked in numerology called triads, they work together. And uh, it's a way to base whether your, your uh, uh, birth value uh, and your first name value are on the same, same path. And if they are, then you're, you're, uh, you're in a good spot. So um, the numbers uh, 369, that's, that's the most, that's the, uh, you know, the golden triangle. Yes. And that, that's one of the paths. The other path is uh, one, five, and seven. One, five, and seven. And the other path is two four and eight. So those are the three paths that uh, Gan talks about in his book. And I'll get you that, that screenshot in one second here. Okay. Uh, right here. I cut his name off, but his name, the name on the author's name is Luo, L-U-O, and the last name is Clement, C-L-E-M-E-N-T, E-N-T. And he wrote this book in 1908. Interesting that uh, you know Gan would play around with uh, with your head because the um, the tunnel through the air has uh, 36 chapters or 360 degrees, the circle. In this book, the ancient science of numbers. There are nine chapters because there are only nine numbers, you know, one through nine, and then it starts uh, over again. In numerology, that's what you do. You reduce your your uh, a larger number into uh, one of the, one of the numbers between one and nine. And uh, so, what he did did in this book, he he talks about how to apply uh, <clears throat> the number calculations based on your birth. Uh, the the day of the in the month of the uh, month you were born, mm -hmm. which gives you the uh, birth value, and then you take your first name, and you compute the um, value numeral uh, total value and reduce it to a number, and if they both agree and they both fall on one of the paths, they um, you're in a good spot. If you have a birth value that does not fall in the same path as your name value you've got a problem. And so I looked up mine. And uh, for me, uh, my first name, V-I-C-T-O-R, um, is on a path of five. And um, when I looked at my uh, birth value, which is the 28th of July, so 28 reduces to uh, the number 10, and then 10 reduces to the number one. Um, I had a problem because I wasn't on the same life path. I mean, I wasn't on the same path. But I, I remember this because this is very interesting. In this book, Gan says, you know, if you have a problem and you want to uh, have the birth value and the name value agreed and they're on the same path you want you may want to change your name and if you can't change your name you may want to start using a nickname and you may want to uh ingrain that in your head by talking about it you know twice a day and then even get your friends to uh to talk to talk to you as uh, in your nickname so i remember when i was working at a record store in chicago and my manager was a, a, a boisterous Armenian uh, guy who knew everything about classical um, singers. You might like this, classical uh, vocalists. Okay. And uh, 
Well, one day, um, I, I, when I would answer the phone, I would, uh, if I didn't want people to know my real name, I would say my name was Zoltan, Z-O-L-T-A-N. And one day I took the day off, and uh, my manager answered the phone, and the guy was asked, somebody was asking for, can I talk to Zoltan? And of course, my manager didn't know who that was. So he says, um, sorry, Zoltan's not here today. He's in Paris, France, signing the Treaty of Versailles. But when I did my um, nickname, Zoltan, and did the path, it worked out. It was a number seven. So I had a one, five, seven. And so I should start using Zoltan as my nickname again. Maybe I'll have a better trading result. But that gives you an idea of uh, how far Gan would go to talk about these uh, concepts. Also, wow. my, my friend, uh, student, who uh, goes by the nickname of Zuko is listening, Z-U-K-O. Uh, his his uh, uh, name path uh, is equals one. Um, the other thing that Gan did is he talked about cycles in this book, and I'm not going to get into that right now because I want to get to the other parts in this presentation. So, okay, buddy. so what does all this mean in terms of um, um, my use of the concept? Well. What I started doing is I started um, trying to figure out a way I could predict where pivot points would occur using a, a method that uh, incorporates the, the law of three and the law of seven and what I now call uh, the VZ uh, key of one through 10 numbers. So I might have a VZ one, v, uh, VZ key of one, two, uh, four, five, uh, six, eight, nine, and, and 10, and then it, actually, if you go above 10, it, it, the, 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 uh, the methodology does not work very well. But I'm gonna go over these charts with you first, but before I do that, um, the reason I think that he uh, Gan picked out the name LUO based on his uh, theory in the, book, in the book he actually wrote is because if you take the name LUO, uh, you get, uh, a uh, name value of three. And remember, uh, you opened up with the words three this, this morning. Right. Uh, okay. Now, yeah. now, what I did is I said, okay, I'm going to take the Gan's first name, but Gan used initials. He uses W and D. So when I take W and D and pretend that's a that's a name, first name, I get a name value of nine. So we all already have three and we have a nine. And his Gan's birth date was on June 6th. So what I think Gan was doing is he sat down and figured out, okay, I want to be the, I want to represent the golden, you know, the the, the golden triangle, three six nine, and that's why if he has a birth uh, uh, value of six and he has a name value of nine, L U O has a, a name value of three, he has now completed the triangle. Huh. And, wow. And that's that's what I that when I read when I did that part of the. Uh, summary and i said this guy is pretty clever so uh did he have a, a long did he have a long fulfilling happy prosperous life after he made all these adjustments i you know what a lot of people say he did but actually his son near the end of gan's life said he didn't and that he died basically not with very much money in his bank account so that that's uh, uh you know something to think yeah. about yeah, they I say that he, about R.N. Elliot too, that yeah. he, he died broke. Yeah, he died broke, too. By the way, did you know that my birthday, July 28th, is the same as uh, Elliot's? Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I, you know, you never know what, what, what happened, what transpired with the family history and finances over time, because there's so many things that people claim that they did or didn't do. Does our uh, president... Does our president need to make some changes on his first name or the Donald? Maybe that's why he went with the Donald. <laughs> well, maybe. Don you know what? I'll huh? have to check in. I'll have to check into that. For you. Yeah. All right, buddy. But here's a, before we go further on here, um, I found a guy who has written a book and his name is Eric Penica. It's right here. It's called uh -huh. Gan Science, the Periodic Table and the Law of Vibration. It's, um, it's put out by, it's published by that company called the uh, Secret Science Institute in LA. Uh, 
And yeah. I've talked to the guy because I bought one of his books called uh, Wheels uh, Within Wheels by Louis Ferrara. And I spent 500 bucks on the book. So this particular book is selling for $4,500. But here's a partial contents of it. So when I looked at it, I wanted to see if he had anything to show that, you know, I was on the right path. And here we go. We got um, harmonic resonance. Uh, there's an author named Keeley, 369. Keeley's thirds and octaves. By the way, um, octaves and music musicians make great traders because they uh, are operating under the law, uh, octave law of seven. Uh, Luo Clements, here's chapter 13 where he says, what's in a name? I don't know. He may have discovered the same thing I did right there. Uh -huh. And yeah. uh, uh, but but let's go on further here. So um, see if I haven't missed anything. OK, there's one interesting thing. One more thing about uh, the tunnel through the air. <clears throat> I noticed this <clears throat> on my own, but um, Olga Morales, who's written a book called um, uh, um, on on Gan and, and the number seven uh, mentions the same thing. I, I discovered this independently. I didn't know <laughs> if anybody else did, but uh, in Gan's uh, book, um, the tunnel through the air. Let me just get a drink of water here. Uh, where chapter thirty-four should be. If you look at the way the, num the Roman numerals are sitting here for chapter 34, it looks like a misprint, right? It looks yeah, like 39. 39. Okay. Yeah. That, that was done on purpose because Robert Gordon, who is the uh, main character in the book, it ha uh, the title of the chapter is Seven Days. So there's a reference to seven. And what Gann did cleverly, and Tony Plummer points this out in his book, Law of Vibration, he wanted to point out that in this page one of this chapter, um, 34, if you take the numbers 34 and you uh, reduce them to seven, um, you have that aspect. And if you take the uh, misprint of 39, that reduces to 12 and then 12 reduces to three. So in this particular page, Gann was introducing you to the two concepts of law of three and the law of seven. I just wanted to point that out. Okay. It's not a mistake. All okay. Right. Um, so let's go. Now let's see what all this means to the traders out there, you know, because we, we know how to compute um, uh, price targets. I do that all, all day long using a, a GAN method uh, for price. But I wanted to see if I could figure out a way to compute time targets based on you know, pivot highs and pivot lows using um, my method that I mentioned before, the law of three, the law of seven, and the VZ uh, key of one, uh, two, four, five, uh, six, eight, nine, and 10. And um, so let's just go over this right now. I'm gonna give you an older chart here. Okay, here we go. This is a chart of the ESs, and I set some GAN angles all the way back to the February low of this year. Okay. <clears throat> this line here, now you can't read it right here because it's very faint, but it is a 45 degree angle one by one line, the famous one by one. So what GAN would say is anything trading below the one by one is in a weakened, weakened position and if you're a bull. And if it's trading above the one by one, it's in a, in a very strong position if you're a bull. So what we see here is since right here, there was an attempt to move above the one by one and it failed. And Gann would always say, you know, look for market re reactions or penetrations through the angle. So here was a re rejection. Yeah. Here's another lower Gann angle and here was support. Here was support again. Um, so right now, this is what uh, you'd, you'd call the two by one. And the two by one angle is uh, the next major angle below the one by one. And so we're in a market that's in between the one by one and the two by one, which to me is pretty, pretty bullish. It's not, it's not the ideal setting. Um, the other thing is, if you notice, I left some astro trading lines on here. 
the Saturn line was 2792, that you convert longitude of the planet on a 360 degree zodiac wheel. Yeah, we got, this number. we got there yesterday, I think 88. Mm -hmm. And so you see here, here was a uh, pivot low that hit right on the Saturn line. But well, I was paying attention to the Neptune line. I cut this off here. This, this is the Neptune line here. And you see the market reacted right here and, and uh, dropped back down, tried it again and went through it. Normally when you have uh, the market moving above these uh, lines or below them, you have a good trading uh, opportunity. Okay. Now the other thing that I wanted to mention, and this is where I bring all of this that I spent 20 minutes on just now talking about, is how did I apply, and I'm still trying to work out the kinks in it, is how, do, how, how can I use uh, the, the GAN's uh, law of vibration theory, the way I use it, uh, to predict market uh, tar target uh, dates based on trading days, not calendar days. So here's an example. Off the June 28th low, which is right here, <clears throat> The law of three time target projection that I had made out ahead of time was 28.4 trading days, 28.4. The actual pivot top was 27 trading days on August 7th. I found out that um, the method is accurate with plus one or minus, plus one or minus on a daily chart. It's less accurate on a weekly chart, <coughs> excuse me, it's, uh, it's off by as many as two days on a weekly chart, two or three days. So I'm sticking with a daily chart for these projections when I do them. So I'm constantly doing projections off of these and you can do them off a of pivot low uh, and you can do them off a of pivot high as well. I could probably do one from here. If I did one from here uh, to get to this, uh, which I, I can do later on in the day and post it, you'll see what I mean. So you can do them off pivot lows and you can do them off pivot highs. So let's go next. The next chart is um, Apple. the Apple chart. Yeah. And the Apple chart, there's a uh, June 25 pivot low, which I used because that's a major low here. I, you can't see the rest of the yeah. left-hand side, but this is a major low. Okay. And I, I installed the, um, the, uh, the one by one, and yeah. this is a little off. This should be come, come down to here, so I can fix that. So we're um, at an inflection point here or an acceleration point. Yes, we are. That's a good observation. We are. We're at the two by one. This is the two by one. This is the one by one. But if you notice, um, this period between here and here, all of this here, did a lot of damage because usually if you're in a healthy up market, the, the, the uh, bars should follow you one by one. Right. But because of all of this sideways um, uh, retracement action, there's a correction here actually. Like it, it um, weakened weakened the Apple uh, trading bars. So and notice here it hit the one by one, a uh, two by one, excuse yeah. me, right here and here and rejected. And that was yeah. another yeah. reason. But here we are again. We're back to the uh, two by one right now. So it's a good good point a good point to uh, look and see what happens. The um, I took the see where my notes are here. I took the uh, method uh, and I try to project time targets again using this pivot here and this pivot here and this pivot here. And now I put my book aside. So I don't know what I did with my notes, but I'll have to post the results uh, later on. So okay. it's interesting that. I'm thinking that if I use GAN angles and I use this other method, the VZ law of three and seven and VZ key of one and so on method, I will be able to get more accurate projections based on where the markets are, are uh, inflecting, right, right here yeah. to right here. Um, and then we're up to here again. Uh, so I wanted to point that out because that's my latest thing because I think uh, um, Spencer, who goes by Spin Man, I mean, he goes by Spencer now on Twitter. He's one of my first students. Right. Yeah. He wanted to know if I had anything interesting at VZ Labs to come out with today. Well, uh, Spencer, I, I did. It was this whole idea of trying to use a method that's not being widely used 
to project um, pivot highs to pivot lows with consistency. So it's a, a work in progress, and that's what I wanted to mention to you. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, other conversations I've had with people and, and traders and students is, is the market rigged? If the, if the, is the market a big black, black box now where uh, technical analysis you can throw it in the garbage can? I don't know how you feel about that. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Okay. I, well, I don't things, think so either. I, I still see things that work. Yeah, I do too. I still, think, I still see things that work. But I can tell you one thing that miserably failed is I had a um, method which is like the, uh, the Bradley indicator. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bradley uses a series of planets and he, he computes the declinations and then he plots them and puts them on a chart. And if you look at a Bradley right now, he, he, uh, the Bradley indicator was predicting a huge drop uh, uh, at the end of July and, uh, uh, and beginning of August and going into a kind of a huge correction into uh, November. But that hasn't panned out yet. Yeah. Now, I, I um, created a method called VZ Vamima, which is a shorthand for M E M, uh, let's see, VZ M E. V E M A, as the shorthand for the three planets Mercury, Venus, and Mars. And I took the declinations of those planets as a, as a short version of a Bradley, because I didn't have time to work out the Bradley stuff all, all, every day. And it failed miserably. It failed. Uh, it failed in January and it failed in um, July. So I just wanted to mention that to you because usually when I see that happening, because the uh, VZ Vamima method to predict tops and bottoms was was about 80% accurate going back to 1987. And then all of a sudden. And all of a sudden it didn't work, but Bradley didn't work either. So just so you know, I don't yeah, just. Not everything, on, not everything works all of the time. Not, yeah, and, yeah. You know, there's different yeah. rhythm. You're talking about it. Certain things may work better depending right. upon the vibration we're in. How's and the other happen? thing. And what you bring up is a very good because uh, two things. Uh, there's what they call inversions where your cycle actually yes. doesn't top out, but actually keeps going. Right. And if you remember the, um, uh, the big solar eclipse from last year on yeah. my son's birthday, August 21. Yeah. Well, I, I track that because I remember reading in a, a book by Larry Pesavento. You know, Larry, you probably yes. interviewed Larry. He's, He's got three excellent me. books on astro trading, and one of his yeah. books on and where he talks about eclipses, he says, "Be careful." <laughs> Excuse me. He says, "Be careful if uh, you have a if you're in a market top and you have an eclipse pattern and the market doesn't drop, it's a good indicator the market's going to go much higher." And that's exactly what happened from last last August right. to now. Right. So uh, you're absolutely right. Keep uh, keep your, uh, uh, as Gann would say, use all the all your tools all the time. But just remember, all your tools are not 100% uh, predictive. Right. Uh, and they, uh, they if you don't learn how to change your mind, you won't have any change left. So obviously, right. a man a man who puts out a statement like that was flexible enough to, as new information came in, and this is constantly a reassessing as new data and price action comes in for you to be able to adjust to it and change your mind. You're right. And you know what? I'm going to give you a personal story now, and, you, and I'm sure you like these because you may even know, have known about him or knew him. He was a trader on the uh, uh, S&P uh, uh, minis, uh, and he also traded, I think, in the IBM options. I'm not uh -huh. talking about Norman Winsky now because I, I know Norman. He used to be part of the one of my members of my old uh, Yahoo group called Gans Ghost. Yeah. But this guy was uh, Edward Topel, T-O-P-P-E-L. Yeah, I don't. He know. lived on the north North Shore in Chicago. He, where I met him was I had a uh, started a Sherlock Holmes club in Chicago called the Criterion Bar Association. And when people see the car, they go, "What are you a law firm?" I go, "No, this is where." Uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, is is notified that there's a Dr. Watson that is looking for a roommate, and uh, the, and uh, so he meets his friend Stanford at at a restaurant which I've been to in London, 
in the financial district. It's called the Criterion Bar. Okay. And they're only open for yeah. lunch and dinner. Um, so right. that's where the name of the group came from. But basically, Edward was one of our members. I, and I didn't know at the time, because I wasn't into trading yet, that he was um, you know, a trader on the S&Ps. But he wrote an excellent book. He passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. He wrote a book called Zen in the Markets, where he talks about what we just covered, that if you uh, get too uh, predictive and, and uh, you think you're 100% right, the market will chew you up and grind you out and throw you in the garbage can. And that's, that was his major point in the book, that you learn to go with the flow, you know, use your indicators, but the market ha has the ultimate uh, rule uh, over you. And if you don't uh, accept that, then you're not going to be uh, going to be around for a while. Stay yeah. humble or stay humble or be humbled. Right. Stay humble. So um, I'm, I'm going to ask you quickly because I haven't talked to you for, for a while. What, what do you think the market's going to do? Because um, we have a cycle pattern that's due to top out here, but it's not topping yet. Um, and uh, other people say, well, it's going to go. It's going to go even higher. Uh, but I think the markets are extended, and uh, we're due for a, a, a reversal. And if you if you look at Tom the Mark, uh, yeah, he's sequential on the patterns. Side. They have they had uh, the pattern uh, bar thirteen on a weekly uh, daily chart uh, actually hit last week. But I've also noticed in the past when I was using the Mark thirteens that if the market went above your 13 predicted uh, market top bar, it usually means much pri much higher prices ahead. So just, just give you a warning. Okay, so I'm looking for a shakeout uh, in the market <laughs> and then new all to, and then uh, new all time highs uh, next year. But I do yeah. think that there's potential for a shakeout into the midterms. Right. And um, okay. the other thing I want to mention for those people I didn't post forex charts, and I want to do that next time maybe. Um, yeah, what's well, the best way for people to get a hold of you, Victor? Because you know, a lot of yeah. people have uh, uh, have a hard time finding uh, teachers with the kind of knowledge that you have. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, it doesn't take that much to teach a three drive with RSI. Uh, filters and fibs and everything, right. but you've had a lifetime of stu uh, studying these masters and and trying to come up with your own edge with what you've learned. Uh, is Twitter the best way for them to reach you at Victor Zimbaroff? Yes, they can either uh, direct message me on Twitter at uh, my handle is at Victor Zabarov. It's my first and Zabarov. last name strung together. Okay. Z B A R E V. Or they can send me an email at uh, Victor, all lowercase letters, Victor Zabarov at yahoo.com. All right. Uh, so all I'm going to ask from you, uh, Victor, is if I need to change my first name from Dale to uh, DJ or something like that. Well, the, the only thing we... I need, huh? I need to get you that information. Did you have? Did you ever have a nickname? Uh, okay. yeah, uh, yeah. They weren't flattering. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but it has something to do with well, pink. All right, well, you know, people would make fun of my I, last name. What I need is I, I just need your uh, the 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 uh, uh, the day uh, in the month you were born. I don't need them. I don't even need the month. I just need the date. Five twenty-seven. Okay. All right. All right, I will get back to you because I can do that in a, in a few minutes. Thank, thank you so you. much, buddy, for coming back You're on it's a for pleasure. your third appearance. And I'm so glad you talked about, I learned that three is not the number of completion, nine is. So that means we have at least six more interviews together. Uh, and as and as a three dog night would say, the one is the loneliest <laughs> number. <laughs> All right, my trading warrior brother. Okay, thank, you, thank you, Victor. Thank you, Dale. Everyone, thank Victor Zubrov, and and follow him on Twitter. And if you want to learn uh, this type of work, you can't find a better guy than Victor. So thank that's you, a wrap for us, everybody. Uh, uh, the Nifty Reverse. E.G. was a decent call today, guys. Don't you think? So uh, that was one of them. Where is it here?
Blake and I were talking about it during the session. Pretty nice break here. And EG, right? Those on this candle, I booked it in case we get, you know, one, two, and another shot up. I don't know what the Aussie did, but it probably popped off that three drive. Eh, no, no trip to Hollywood. But yeah, the three drive, we're getting some upside here. And the S&Ps are trying to hold. But uh, you look at the four hour of the S&Ps and we're still back underneath the throw over as we are in the Dow. And actually the NASDAQ is a relative weakness today, guys, uh, down uh, half a percent compared to, which is different than last week when I was away and it was grinding me. So uh, we'll see everyone tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Remember, don't forget to join Forex Analytics. And most of all, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. Uh, see you at Paulie's uh, European crossover tomorrow morning. And if you're not happy with your broker, don't forget to get a hold of Trent or Justin at Forest Park FX. See you everyone tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your day. If you're not a member, you can join and go see what Blake is up to. See if he covered his EG. That was a great call. And what Steve is up to and Stelios and the 90 other guys or, and ladies in there. Uh, including Amanda, what they're thinking of this uh, dollar weakness that came into the market during the interview. Uh, that's a wrap for me. I'll see everyone tomorrow. Good hunting. Adios, and thank you, Victor.